Hey everyone, it's Zach Dewhurst with Deco Experts. And today's podcast topic is how to diversify your business through different streams of revenue. My guest today is Hunter Strind of Maryland Print House. Hunter has been in the industry for many years. He does a lot of different things within the custom decoration industry, makes money a lot of different ways, and has got a lot of great information to share with us on how he manages his business and has um, actually grown it during the last year during the crazy pandemic. So um, to start, I'm gonna introduce Hunter. Hunter, if you can tell us a little bit about your business, Maryland Print House. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on, Zach. I appreciate it. Um, Deco Network has been great to us and um, I think this is awesome what you're doing. So, um, but yeah, so I started in the industry about, I started screen printing like 10 years ago um for myself um on the side and i built a press actually with my dad my dad built the press um and yeah so i started screen printing then and i was a sophomore in high school and um you know kind of over time through college i played soccer in college and uh started printing for other people um and through that um i started to realize that there was a market for influencers i started one of my companies creators label um and from there i kind of realized how much opportunity i had i had grown that business very quick um and i told my parents look i'm done so i dropped out of college um as a sophomore and quit soccer and pursued it full time um that was in 2016 and from there i kind of realized like all my print partners uh up to this point sucked and I wanted to kind of control that part of the business. So um, we opened Maryland Print House. I opened it with my two partners, um, Andrew Bergamoski and Andrew Boone, um, one in sales, one in production, and then me. And uh, the goal was to print for our sister companies, one of which is Every Locker um, and Creators Label. And so Maryland Print House was born to really do that at first. And then obviously just through the name and we knew our main goal was to build a B2B company, um, providing quality products uh, to customers that needed, you know, custom products. Um, but we, we had a main focus on quality and we're not gonna sell somebody a guild and we're not gonna, you know, just sell them on the cheapest item. You know, we're gonna work with them to figure out what fits their brand, what fits their company best. Um, and we're gonna sell them what we feel as the professionals is best for them. So, so yeah, that's a little bit about us. Maryland Print House was started in 2018. I think I said that, but yeah. So one, one of the core competencies or what differentiates your business from the average print shop is you don't just try to produce the request and call it a day. You are trying to get that best possible outcome to your client based on what they're asking you. Is that kind of correct? Yeah. I mean, the reality is, look, like everybody knows a t-shirt guy, right? And I'm sure you've all heard that before, but um, you know, you're in, you're in two businesses. One is to make a quality product. And when I say quality, investing in R and D and making sure that your prints are better than anybody um, close to you with it within 60 miles, in my opinion. Um, or on par with the best and then the second thing is relationships like we're in a relationship business and so um you need to make your customer feel like they're part of your family and you know that's i, I would say those two things are really what carry us forward and also the third um it's really shocking i think it's nice that this is a deco network podcast but technology i think like being technologically forward with your business and showing um giving your customers an easy experience is very important um, and you'd be surprised at how many shops out there, you know, still use pen and paper to, to process quotes and push production orders through. It's, it's, it's nuts. And you can't be efficient that way. No, no, I, I agree. You can't be uh, efficient. And, you know, you just mentioned their R&D. And I, I love r and I, I agree with you. Um, I, I'm one where don't assume that the sales rep who sells you the ink, when they tell you this is the greatest white of all time to screen print with don't agree with it until you've tried another five different brands of ink uh, because it is amazing um, what a little bit of investment and just different samples of supplies and do you kind of do it the same way with blank products so you can uh, communicate that with your customers 
Um, yeah, so so we'll, we'll order. Uh, so first, with uh, on the R and D of the decoration side, we we give our managers every year a budget. Um, so this isn't just like uh, oh, a new thing came out. Like this is a, a yearly thing. We do this every year, and um, you know we give them a budget and say these are some things that like up you know management is looking at and thinks that it's something we should look into, but. Uh, also, what do you want to do? What do you want to learn about? What do we want to, what do we want to try to work on next? Um, so we give them that budget and they can do whatever they want with it. Um, as long as they're buying things for, for their department, but, um, I forget what's going, but the, the second part is like, you know, with, with garments and, and distributors, um, first is talk to your distributor, right? You, they should be giving you a budget, right? If you're spending serious money with them, um, they should be giving you a budget. And if they're not, go to the next one. Um, so, you know, we work with the budget that we're giving or given from our uh, from our distributor. And um, if we need other stuff, obviously we'll buy it. But we always have current products in our showroom. Yep. And, and, and we, um, go, go ahead. it's like you were kind of mentioning there with um, like sample products and you have a showroom. So you do have some of your customers obviously come to your place of business and you have product on hand to show them, hey, you want a quarter zip? Here's 10 different quarter zips that we sell the most of. Um, and one thing I, I often, I, I, can't, I don't understand why more shops don't take advantage of like Sanmar, SNS, Alpha. They provide a lot of marketing resources. I know Sanmar, for example, will sell me brand, um, grommeted products. So it has extra information on there. Everything I'd want to communicate to the customer. What different styles does it come in? What colors, sizes, et cetera? and they'll sell it to me at half of the normal price. So they're yeah, trying so, to get me a product that they've done more work for at a cheaper price so I can sell more of that product. Um, right. And, and, so what and, we yeah. so, sorry, go ahead. Well, it just seems like a lot of shops, they, they don't take advantage of those little tools that their suppliers, they're trying to help them push that product, uh, obviously. So um, in, in your showroom, um, you know, how, how does, how do you, we, we talked about it kind of earlier, but not everybody likes a walk-in customer. It can be a bit of a nightmare, but if you have the samples and other things already laid out in an organized fashion, I bet that conversation's a lot easier than just whipping out a catalog and flipping through pages with them. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, right? <laughs> like, I mean, like I said before, if it was up to me, we wouldn't have walk-ins at all. I think the best part is like when you need to bring somebody in, you can, um, you know, that's already a customer or is a buyer and, you know, you're inviting them into your workplace. Um, but so what we do and we're actually actively setting this up is we put our own tags on all of our products um, because, you know, we, we, we wanted it to be branded for us. Um, so we're, we're putting QR codes on, um, all of the products so this, the sales rep can pull up the Deco Network page and see the pricing and all that stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we, we built our own and we put on there what decorations they can be decorated with, the product name, the code, the supplier, all of that information. So, yeah, we do the same thing. We just do it ourselves. And that's the other part of it. Like if, if the supplier's not doing it, do it yourself because it, go, it does go a long way. And, and to, to kind of circle back to your R and D on the decoration processes and so forth. You actually have a budget set aside. Um, not to not to say anything negative about our industry, but our our industry is very much so a mom and pop industry. I talk every day with one person shops. I talk with fifty person shops. Um, a lot of different size businesses are are within the industry. Um, but something you know, having your three owners, the way you said, it, and and it, it seems like you kind of look at your business, not so much like a business, but you treat it like a company. Because when I started my first decoration shop, I, I, I kind of told myself in a weird way, I don't want to create a local business, but that's really what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to really create more of a local company. I want to grow it. I want to treat it, it, it again, take it very seriously. Um, and, and I think things like, you know, setting a budget for just R and D and, and like you said, it didn't even have to have a specific goal in mind there. I mean, obviously they're, they're within reason, but I bet you I guarantee you, your employees love the fact 
that you give them a budget and you let them explore um, because who knows what you're going to stumble upon and what's go what what you're going to be able to do that your competition can't. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting how um, you look at it. You know, I think a lot of businesses um, they they look at it just as a business, not so much as I'm building a company. Um, and, a, and a company just has that more of that long term. Um, hey, if I hate to say this, Hunter, you get hit by a car tomorrow. Maryland Printhouse yeah. is still going strong. You know. You... Well, and that's and so we built our. You know, when I was building this company, part of it was like. Do I like if if I need to be there every day? That's a problem, um, yep. you know. And that's that you can never sell a company where you're the the company, right? So, um, you, you know, that was always part of the thought. And you can talk to any of my employees, and they'll tell you that the one thing I say year after year, quarter after quarter, is we have to be prepared for scale. We have to be prepared. We need to do the things that we need to do to be ready for this. Um, and it's for us in our growth patterns over the last three years it's it's been a constant you know hiring new people i mean it, it's nuts but at the same time like you know with what you're saying it's really cool when a local business grows to 100 employees you know and that's possible and i think the problem is that this industry is hard it's hard as shit. and you know i think i think one thing that people start to realize is they become complacent because it's it's very hard to grow a business in this industry it's it's a bottom of the barrel like who can give me the cheapest shirt and if you're in that part of the industry you know you're gonna have challenges and it's it's way harder to grow um so that's why we've kind of placed ourselves outside of that and said look you know you're coming to us we're the professionals you know we're gonna give you what you want but we're investing in you as a customer too like and the other reason we do r d is because you know we don't want to get stuck with a lost opportunity you know, if somebody comes to us and we aren't familiar with, um, let's say, silicone printing um, or uh, water-based and we just printed Plastisol the whole time, like if a customer comes to us and needs 20,000 pieces and they want it water-based, well, we need to be there and we need to be able to do it. You know, we don't need to, we don't want to learn right right now. We, we want to know how to do it. And so um, part of that budget also is to prepare ourselves for what's to come or what could come. And it's not, it's once you get to the point where you can have a budget, it's obviously a good thing. And I understand how hard it is to, because we were there to, to not be able to do that. But, um, you know, there's always time for learning. And I think that a lot of people don't take advantage of that extra time. Yep. Now, I, I completely agree with you. And um, it, it also sounds like as you grow your business, you need to leverage your assets and really everything so like even in, when you're when you're buying ink and you're getting samples or some and you're going to do r d if you reach out to your rep and you're like can i get some samples a lot of the time either a they'll give them to you or b they'll get them to you at dirt cheap prices because hey there's you're not going to start using that product until you've actually used it um so again would you agree that um don't just assume something is what it is because a sales rep tells you something or it that that's what the price is going to be um sometimes you have to kind of work the ladder and um talk to the decision maker and, and then actually find out okay how can we work together and, and so forth one thing i know that you mentioned earlier uh before we started the podcast was um shipping uh you mentioned you know one call from one call to UPS and before you know it, you're paying half of what you were paying before that call, just because you've taken the time to leverage what you currently have. Is that right? Right. Yeah. So, and, but also to start, like part of this is like understanding the value and doing it. Um, you know, and obviously you just said that you can get things for free, but also a lot cheaper. Um, but how you do that is by being strategic with your purchasing. Like, you're not going to, the, the odds are, um, you're not going to be able to go to a, a supplier that you don't use and say, Hey, I need this for free. But yeah. if that supplier has a lot of things that you need, like start centralizing your purchasing as much as you can to that supplier and build relationships with multiple. But, um, you know, you have to have that, le you have to leverage your, your, your spend, um, and leverage the size of your company. Um, and, and, and talk to these reps because you're right they will give it to you for free um and they are more than willing to help you 
if you spend money with them and if you guys build a relationship. That's why, that's why these, um, you know, I, I wish that um, uh, the trade shows were going on because like yeah. that's the time where we really can spend time beating our suppliers on price and saying, hey, like this is what we need, like make it happen. Um, Cause it's way better to do it in person um, than it is doing on the phone and trying to get a hold of them. But, but yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. I, I definitely have missed the trade shows the past year. It, they're, they're always fun to learn where the industry is going, talk to reps. Um, is that it, when, when we're not in a pandemic, is that something you try to attend at least one a year, maybe bring some employees to, to we show? Take our staff. We take, our, take entire our entire staff. We take our entire staff. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, at least we, we don't take them across to Long Beach, but um, yeah. <laughs> mostly just the uh, um, uh, owners and, and maybe managers. But we take them all to Atlantic city. It's one, something we do every year. It's, you know, okay. I think it's important because to me, like I'm hiring based on passion, you know, I want to yeah. know that you want to do this. Um, and if you want to do this, you're going to really enjoy staying at a casino and going to a trade show during the day and yeah. <laughs> gambling at night. Right. So yeah. no, it's absolutely important. And I think it, um, you know, but, but you brought up that ISS show in Long Beach and, and anybody right. who has attended it will, will agree that there is no show like that. I mean, it is on another level. Is that something that you and your co-owners try to attend each year? Uh, well, we actually went for the first time um, and we bought a press there. That was the reason we went. Um, and that was the first time we went. It was like, what, 2019? They didn't do it in 2020, right? Or was it 2020? Yeah, uh, yeah 20, 20, whatever. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, anybody who goes to that show, know that it takes you three full days at least to get through every booth if you have yeah, it's nuts. I mean, it's <laughs> nuts how, how big but it is. The other thing I want to say is like, go to the trade shows on a mission too. Like you yeah. can get so wrapped up in, in so much nonsense if you don't like schedule what you're going to do. Like build a plan and, and, and focus on those things because, you know, sometimes like, at the earlier days like we found ourselves just walking around like <laughs> doing nothing productive um but you know there's an opportunity there to be productive and to to build relationships with the people that are going to end up being really important or are important hunter you sound like you've been doing this for you know decades and so forth will, will you share with everyone how old you actually are right now yeah i'm 25 um my 25. partners my other partner's 25 and then the my other partner is 21 so yeah, we're a lot young company. We have um, two employees that are over 20, 25. So, yeah. <laughs> you got an ageism problem ups. going on there. <laughs> it has ups and downs for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and when right, you, so. hi, you know, you, you're not hiring based on youth, but I mean, you can't typically get a lot of passion, a lot of people who haven't made, who haven't built bad um, habits and so forth and so forth. Um, when you are hiring those employees, what is the first quality you look for in a employee team member? Um, you know, I, so our hiring process is pretty simple. Like I, to, to be honest, depending on the role, like I hardly read um, a uh, resume. Um, but the first thing I'll do is I'll look at Facebook and I'll see if they're, you know, are they out doing hood rat shit with their friends? Like, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah. um, and if, if, if they seem like they actually care about what they want to do, then we'll bring them in, we'll talk to them. Um, but I'm really looking for passion. You know, I wanna see somebody, I wanna talk to somebody that has the same goals that I, I have. Um, and enjoy the startup phase of business. Um, you know, I miss the old days of Maryland Printhouse sometimes, you know, um, it's just, you know, building the business has always been the funnest. Um, but at the same time, like if I can help an employee follow their dreams, like, that's the goal, right? We're here to help each other. Um, they're making my dreams come true and I'm gonna do my best to make theirs come true. And, um, you know, so we have a lot of great um, uh, benefits as well, including profit sharing, including all of those things. But yeah, I mean, the most important thing I look at is, are you legit and are you passionate? And if you have both of those things, I'm sure we can make something work. And you might just get hired even if we're, if we're not that position, we make one for you, you know? Um, because it's really hard to come by. Yep. Yeah. I, I've always, yeah, you hire passion and work ethic and you train yes. skill often. Correct. Um, yeah. I mean, and the sad reality is like degrees don't mean anything as much anymore. Like, you know, we were just, I was just on a podcast the other day talking about this. 
um, you know, and it's, it's, it's really a tough um, situation because your, your people are coming in with degrees and they, they have to break a minimum pay, you know, and yep. it's like, you haven't done anything. You, you've went to school and the, and the sad part is like what you've learned in school doesn't apply even art like you know illustrator like it's so hard to find somebody that that has an understanding on the industry level um yes. yep. and so if you're if you're coming out of school with this degree it doesn't equal better pay um and it, it's it's a really tough situation we're in and it's really the schooling system's fault um and it's you know it's really unfortunate but but yeah that's the harsh reality um before the pandemic hit how many employees did you have um i don't remember what i told you <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember uh i think it was like mm, 13 14 something like that how many do you currently have um no i'm sorry it was 11 we have 15 now two sales reps so 17. and during the past year when the world turned upside down you actually brought on more people uh, obviously everyone had to pivot in some way yeah um masks how many masks do you approximately think you printed last year uh printed i think I, like maybe a hundred thousand I, I know we sold like 350 to 400 thousand masks all together units and um you know when the pandemic first hit how quickly and as soon as it was like hey we're about to shut down we got to start wearing these things um, I remember being on the Deco Network Facebook group and immediately seeing, look, Hunter's print masks before everybody else. Um, and, and it, it, it did seem like each week it was like insane, um, you know, just trying to get the product and so forth. How many different mask types do you think you printed over the past year? Um, well, let me say this. So April 6th is when we, we, we built uh, MaskUS.com in one day. We, we sat down and we were like, dude, we're taking too long to do this. Like we, we thought about it before. Um, it's actually, it was on me. I was like, man, this isn't gonna turn into this, is it? Um, and my partner's like, dude, like every day goes by and we're not doing it. I'm like, all right, let's do it. So I cranked it out. We built the, the Shopify store um, in a day and that was April 6th. So from there on, that's when we started. Um, but as far as how many different masks, so we set out to make our own um at the beginning early stage of this because we knew that supply was going to be a problem and we wanted to stay consistent so we bought <laughs> we bought sewing machines and um, <laughs> i i never had sewn anything in my life and i started to sew our first um sample and i sewed it myself actually and so from there i, I was kind of like yeah i don't like sewing <laughs> um and i'm not going to be able to do this at scale and i definitely wouldn't have been able to do 300,000 of them that's for sure um and being in maryland it's it's hard to find uh sewers so like we don't have like sewing houses like you have in la um so it was really challenging like we were trying to find local suppliers with our schematic you know all of that and so that didn't work so we ended up just um we made our own schematic we flew to la we opened a factory with um a, a strategic partner of ours that, that also does that does printing out in uh, LA and they, we opened the factory and we could do everything we needed to do custom PMS uh, you know custom masks custom colors whatever um, we picked up some really large accounts through selling masks um, and so it was important that we had our our own factory we knew we had capacity because at the beginning the real problem was capacity like you could only crank out 5,000 masks a day in a factory and it was like dude like we need more than that um how are we going to get more than that uh because not only are we stocking our retail site which we sold a ton of masks through that um but we're also fulfilling custom orders for 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 clients um and so so yeah so that's so we made our own and then eventually you know i worked with brian at, at uh ryanet and we started selling uh, those uh, we actually won the the top seller of of all masks uh, which was really cool we got to donate like a thousand masks to um, local um, police departments, fire departments, stuff like that. Oh. Um, but but yeah, so so we started to bring on some. We never actually really like sat down and brought on um, any of the ones that are out now, uh, because like it had slowed down by the time like everybody got to market, like SNS and all those guys that like, got everything on there. And we had our bread and butter. 
we were able to manipulate our mass through three versions, which started with the USA V2. And if you go on massus.com, you can see that. Um, but it started with the USA V2, which was just a simple two ply, 95% cotton, 5% um, uh, not nylon. It's mass <laughs> the, the US. <laughs> um, it's and, not uh, US mask the us um five percent spandex mask the us val the the as in the 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 US. us no 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 us.com mask the us.com <laughs> yeah um but so yeah so we started with the usa v2 which was just the plain no filter pocket no nose wire none of that and then we made the USA V3, which you can see here, which included a filter pocket. We were actually in the middle of making the USA V4, which was gonna have the nose piece. Um, but what we learned is that factories just disappear in LA. <laughs> so actually <laughs> like two weeks ago, our factory is now gone. They just, they all left. So who knows where they're at and what they're doing, but we have to now use supplier masks and when our stock depletes, it's, I mean, it's pretty much over. Like we don't sell that much anymore. Hunter, like as far as like, uh, our sales. You, you remind me a little bit of, of Ryan. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't know Ryan, but I can no, tell you, anybody who, who knows who Ryan, at, Ryan Moore is, uh, this guy had a band and he started screen printing. And before you know it, he owns silkscreenprinting.com or screen print. He owns them all, all the great ones. Yeah. And ryanet.com is a great website to buy supplies and so forth. But what really Ryan did better, does better than anybody, he has thousands of videos on how to screen print and everything else. He, you know something funny? So Ryan and I are tight now, but we he's the one that taught me how to screen print. How oh. was that? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> Well, get, guess who taught me how to screen print through DVD? Ryan did. <laughs> did he? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, for $20, uh, tell you what, his DVD is the greatest thing you can get at a trade show. Um, yeah. But that, I mean, really, um, Hunter, not to keep bringing up your age, but how does two 25-year-olds and a 21-year-old figure out, hey, we're going to fly across the country, literally across from the East Coast to the West Coast, and we're going to meet with some people, and we're going to, you know, create a factory and start manufacturing something we've never done before. I mean, we, well, the reason we did it was for our employees. Like our sales were so, so low, like it was so bad. And I set out at the beginning of this, like we're, we're a multi-million dollar company and we had $5,000 in the bank. Like that's the reality. And um, I refused to let anyone go. I was ready to cut my pay before I let anyone go. And um, because the people that work for us are just so important to me. I mean, they mean everything to me as far as like, they make shit happen that I can't do on my own. Um, and they care. And so, you know, the reason we, we did this was for our employees. Um, you know, it's, it sucks when you're in that position and it's like, man, I have to lay these people off. Like that's the worst thing you ever have to do um, for, for any leader, any boss, any manager. Like it's the worst thing. So um, I was like, dude, we just, we can't do that. So that's why we did it. I mean, that's, that's why we built Mass the US because otherwise, quite frankly, it could have been over for us. And, um, and, and as the owner, you, you, you feel like, I mean, again, we, what I love about our industry in general, I've always loved it. And this is why I, I decided to get in the decoration industry. One, we're always gonna wear apparel that's a fact we're always going to wear clothes that that's never going to stop uh but two what i really like about the re uh, decoration industry is how many different ways you can make money you know you can you can work b2b b2c you can drop ship fulfill you can do contract or in your case here you started manufacturing um and it it, it there's just a lot of different ways you can utilize your skills knowledge equipment and so forth um to grow your business and also diversify it because yeah. not to say you had all your eggs in one basket before the pandemic i mean we all were pretty much in that same case um yeah but by di diversifying your revenue model your, really your revenue route streams whatever you want to call them um you really are reducing that risk of potentially having to shut down the business at any point 
because um, you know when I first started using Deco Network software, uh, I was studying marketing at uh, Ohio State University, and I fell in love with the affiliate marketing model. Hey, you know you can have 500 sites, you can provide them to a client, you drop ship fulfill for them. And I had I've had several clients where hey every year we're doing 300 500 grand a year, but before you know it, that same client. Uh, find somebody just like your business and they start chasing a lower price. Yep. And, 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 and at, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm like you, uh, Hunter, I'm not going to print for pennies. I'm not, not, I, I don't seek everyone's business. Uh, if, if you're going to go chase that lower price, go ahead. Um, but I can't have all my revenue tied in that one client. It is not a good business model because I think that's their business. Um, yeah. And, and um, that's where I think, yeah, you, you, why I really wanted you on this podcast is because obviously you do a lot of different things and it, it I, I, in a weird way, it, it takes, you know, you're reducing risk by taking some risk, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's a lot of risk. It, you're, you're, you, you don't know if something's going to work until you kind of try it yourself. Um, I'm one, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a hands-on person. I kind of need to do something and fail at it sometimes instead of letting somebody tell me, don't do it that way. Uh, it, it sounds stupid, but again, you, you sometimes have to learn. You have to learn from your mistakes. Um, and you one thing I like, too. like that's a big and, one. And, and, you know, you, you mentioned playing soccer. Soccer is the best sport to play, by the way. Um, yeah. One thing I learned, I, I listened recently to a, a baseball game, and, and it made a lot of sense to me. I never heard it this way. But to learn how to win, you first have to lose, if that makes sense. You know, you have to yeah. experience, just like you have to make those mistakes to learn from them and grow. Um, and, and and something that, that you're also kind of proving, um, you know, talking about right now is, you're a leader of the business and, you know, like your employees, it sounds like you view them as they, they're obviously team members. Um, you know, I always like to look at, Hey, you're on my, you're on a team with me. You don't work for me. You work with me on growing our company and so forth. Um, but you, it seems like you take it to even another level of their family. Um, yeah. and, and you're trying to grow with them. I know you just had a, um, daughter pretty recently and During all of that, actually, I had a daughter a year stuff. and a half ago and it, I, it's amazing how I bet, I bet your, your, um, outlook on how the world works. It changed the day she was born. Did it not Hunter? It's yeah. And I mean, the nuts, the nuts part about it is it was happening during all of the mass stuff. Um, like, you know, my girlfriend being pregnant and, um, trying to, to manage everything. It was a really eye-opening experience um, for me. And it, and it was actually the first time ever in my business that I realized that I had, I had executed on all of the things that I wanted to execute by allowing myself to not be required to be in the business. Um, because I had always worked on the business for so long that yeah. the goal was to not have to be there every day. And it allows me to, to have the flexibility now. And before... I was always there and I was always fixing problems and I hadn't set up the infrastructure to, to remove myself from the business. And I don't mean that in a way of like, I don't do anything for the business. That's not the case. Um, but I don't have to be there at every beck and call. And I think that's important. If you're a business owner and you're not working on your business and you're, you know, always the one fixing everything, like you've got to change that because there's going to be a time where you can't be there. Um, and you're never going to be able to sell it. So, you know, it's just, it's just not wise. Now you, you, you actually took the words out of my mouth. They, you too, I think a lot of shop owners, and I understand if you're a mom and pop shop, it, it and, and, and even you were technically a mom and pop shop at one yeah, point. We were. Two years um, ago, three years ago. You, you, like, like you, you work either on your business or you work in the business. When you're on a press and you are actually doing that, that's working in the business and that is not growing it. That's not going to allow you to learn more and, and see where the industry is going. When you're working on the business, you're able to really play the role of CEO. Um, yeah. You know, and that's what um, I think, again, a lot of businesses, um, 
you are right. They they don't realize, hey, instead of you doing this as well, you can hire somebody to do it. And now you can focus on the things that'll keep growing the business and so forth. Um, and and I, I also think, you know, I, I would say the average, the majority of shops, I mean, I've talked to hundreds of shops, kind of like yeah. yours, hundreds of shops. I would bet 95% at least have one owner most of the time. Yeah. Would you say having those two other owners has really helped you? I mean, you know what they say, would you rather own 100% of something that makes, you know, 100 grand a year? Or would you rather own 33%, for example, of something that makes 10 million a year? It's kind of common well, sense. I mean, I'm so yeah. So let me, I'll, I'll explain to you how this happened. Um, because I've had partners before and it didn't work. And I've had a lot of people say like, why do you have partners? Um, I had a successful business prior to Maryland Print House. Um, and so that gave me the flexibility of um, bringing some foreseen revenue to Maryland Print House, right? Um, but the real reason that I brought partners on board is because it made sense. Like I had two guys, one that was a screen printer and one that sold for me in the past. And I, I still own a majority of the business, but I, I knew that as a, as a startup with Maryland Print House, I mean, I walked into it having like 10, 15 grand in my pocket, like not a lot, but enough to like get a press, a starter press and to get like a manual, get like a dryer, get all this stuff um and to get like infrastructure down but i knew that like i couldn't afford to pay employees and i knew that it wasn't valuable for me to be the one doing it all um and i knew that going into it and so that's why i went to them and i said guys look i'm not a greedy person like i know that if this is big enough like i'll be fine um but do you want to be partners and you know we'll figure this all out we'll all work for free we'll all go through the same hurdles and i've been working for free really for <laughs> before this, like eight years. I mean, I, I now take a salary, which is nice. Um, but, you know, we can all come together and, and, and we can really make something special. And, you know, they said yes, and that's how it started. But the part, the, having the right partners is important because like, it, it, you know, shit changes, life changes. And, you know, you don't want to have partners that are going to be like, oh yeah, you know, you just had a kid and you're not there every day. Like, and, you know, but and that's not the case and that's why i love my team because you know we've set the expectations already everybody knows the expectations they know everybody in the business knows why i'm not there not even just my partners but everybody um because they realize now if they ever go and start their business they're going to hopefully do the same thing because i think it was wise but who's to say like you know what i mean so it's it's just important to to have people behind you that also have the same kind of grit and and they're better as hungry as I am for success. No, and I, yeah, I and and you know I was I I I, I thought I was young until uh, I started talking with you, and now I'm six years <laughs> older than you are. But um, when, when you, you try to be, you know, I always told myself eventually I'm going to be 32, and right now I'm 31, so I'm about to be 32. So what I always and I always said 32 because my dad was 32 when i was born and i'm the oldest so just kind of like hey you're gonna yeah. be 32 like your dad and you're gonna probably have your own family and if you want to spend as much time with them as possible kill yourself now in your early 20s 100 percent. get your business where it needs to be and you will have more flexibility don't worry about you know and it's kind of funny because i had i all of what made me want to be an entrepreneur is all of my friends parents own businesses my parents had great careers working for the state and they retired at 56 years old but um one thing that i saw in my friends you know parents they had more freedom than anybody and i often yeah. kind of thought man that, at times they're lazy and then you actually talk with them and you realize no they just they, like they have a lot of free time now but they put in a ton i mean they, those there was no such thing as a 40 hour week in their 20s it was a 60 yeah. 80 hour week sometimes and when you're young you can often do that grind but it, it um like like we've kind of said if you build a company if you set it up the infrastructure and everything else so that it can run itself like a company instead of a business where the owner has to be there for the gears to turn 
um, yeah, you're in a much better uh, place. Um, uh, so Hunter, let's 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 kind of come over and, and recap some things. So sure. um, the most common streams of revenue through the decoration industry: one, B two B, B two C. And, and when I say B, that that's again B two B would be again obviously business to business. Anybody uh, it could be a restaurant. You're just shipping or you're printing for. It could be an everyday consumer. I'm like you. I hated the walk-ins. I I'm now out in the country. I don't let anybody walk in. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I've got I've got a five acre property with a 2,500 square foot uh, shop out in the backyard. You're not coming to it, and and I can be <laughs> a lot more productive. Uh, I'll tell you what. It, if it's and and here's how I do it a lot of the time, Hunter. And and I'm a little bit different with some of the things I do, but um, you know, it it's if it's pouring down rain on Saturday, but Tuesday is 90 degrees and beautiful. I'm outside on Tuesday. I'm printing on Saturday. Um, and, and so, but with the B2B, B2C, to B um, there most shops work with both. Um, but it, it sounds you kind of mentioned you, and I agree. I would prefer to work with the businesses over the consumers. Yeah, B2B, I don't. I don't think well, there's any value in B2C necessarily, unless you have a stupid efficient process and can do one-offs really efficiently, and you're killing killing it doing it. It's just that. that it's all it, it's all about efficiency and technology and pricing things right and it's just it's i don't know to me it's a nightmare and that's why i talked to you guys prior to this but we're working on something to tackle that market a little bit well, well and yeah with the, with the b2c again like you said it's a one-off decoration uh market more so you know d to g dtg sublimation uh, a yeah. lot of those types of things versus embroidery i mean embroidery definitely is ordered by consumers but businesses order more embroidery than anybody and and the bulk printing and so forth. So a lot of your decorate, what processes you offer in house and equipment you have will often dictate what revenue streams you can pursue and what who your target market is. Um, yeah. Now, uh, outside of fulfilling orders for businesses and consumers, um, one thing you haven't really mentioned, and I don't think you really really do, but you kind of did with the masks. Um, was a retail niche brand. I mean, Mask USA, actually, how could you not call that a retail niche? Yeah, um, no, that's definitely that's the right. USA.com. It You have a specific niche that you're trying to target, and you targeted that. Um, I am uh, located in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we Everybody here is very passionate about being Ohioan. I, Maryland's just a great Maryland's probably ten state. times worse. So yeah, uh, so highswag.com. High um, I don't really push it that much, but this is my retail niche brand. If if I want to make some passive income by selling, um, you know, Ohio themed apparel to uh, Ohio ends, it's a great way to make some money. Before you know it, though, uh, once in a while, you, you can stumble upon somebody who, hey, do you do the custom stuff? And then before you know it, they own a business and they funnel you big orders as well. Um, Another way you can make uh, money in this industry is contract slash wholesale fulfillment. And um, when it comes to contract, you can fulfill for others in the decoration industry. You can fulfill for kind of retail uh, uh, Disney, for example. Um, what is your, um, I guess, how do you go about contract work and, and, and what's your uh, thank you behind it. Well, if we could find a building, it would be a lot better. And I can tell you actually how it goes. But right now, um, hold on. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, but right now, um, the we would we would set it up on separate presses and have one press do retail, one press do contract. But um, I don't know. We keep contract around like 10 percent of our business, ten to fifteen percent. Um, not on purpose. Uh, we would do more. But our capacity is really tied up. I mean, our other press, our brand new rock has been in storage for since the Long Beach train show. Um, it, it's it's terrible. Like, and it, oh, so gosh. yeah, our real estate out here has just been killing us, and it takes two years because we have water issues in our city um, to build. So we're just waiting on a building to come up, and we're I mean we're in thirty five hundred square feet. <laughs> we need like ten twelve thousand. So, you know, we're just living with what we have right now. And um, 
you know, it is what it is, but I would, I, I think contracts great. I think, I mean, we fired customers before, like they, the customer is important. You have to like working with the customer and they have to understand and do things the way that you want them done because it is a, it is a penny pinching business. You know, it's, it's cheap. Um, and it's important that all the processes are in place to make that the same every time is, is the customer filling out the paperwork the same? Are they, are they submitting a form on the site the same? Are they, it needs to be constant. And so, um, that was one of our focuses. Um, the other thing is like, like we've fired six digit contract customers before, um, literally last year. Like, so if they aren't working and they aren't following what you're asking and they're, whether they're questioning your price or whatever, just tell them to kick rocks. Like it, it contract doesn't need to be miserable. Like everybody makes it seem like it, it, it can be decent. If you allow it to become miserable, then that's on you. Um, because dude, we've been in like talks with shops, whether to acquire them or just talking in general. And the conversation is like, we don't touch contract. And when we do like, nah, it doesn't need to be like that. You just need to have control of what's happening, you know? Yeah. And so if you're going to touch contract, just make sure you retain control and don't care what people are saying. Like, just because it's a big account, dude, that doesn't mean anything. That big account can lose you money. Yeah. Well, and, and one thing I always thought was just an overstatement of, look how much revenue I made. I don't care how much revenue you made. I want to know how much you profited. I don't care if you've made millions of dollars. If you did, if yeah. you profited 10 grand, it means nothing. It, it's how much did, how much did you actually bring in after all your expenses? Um, well, and the sad part is like contractors, one thing so cheap, like we've even considered like changing our inks for it. Like we, we buy the most expensive inks that money can buy. Like I talked about quality earlier. Like if you want it cheap, like we might build a, a special cheap price <laughs> and we're using yep. the cheapest things we can buy. But yeah, I mean, it's all about control. No, and I, I, I totally agree with you with the contract. It is a relationship that you are kind of man. You're only as strong as your supply chain. I don't care what business you're in. You're only as strong as your supply chain. If you're buying product from SNS and you're re and obviously you're marketing to your customers, hey, I, I, SNS, one of our suppliers, and you go to order a product from SNS and they don't have it, your consumer doesn't look at you and like, oh, what's wrong with SNS? They look at it as if, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have that? Why can't we get this? Um, so your supply, it's the same thing with the contract world. Um, they often want to, they want to make money by doing less work. Well, they need to follow your rules because um, yeah, right. you're the and supplier. That too is you don't tell SNS what's right. going on. Yeah. Well, and part of contract is you like always, if you're listening to this and you do contract work, try to sell the shirts to the customer. It increases your buying power with your, your supplier. Like that's something I always try to do because we have better deals with our suppliers in some cases than some of our customers. Dude, I would sell the shirts to them all day long for a penny or two over. It doesn't matter to me. Part of the yep. problem is getting the garments to you and this contractors always want to supply them. So I don't know. That's just like a little tip. Like yeah, no, and, and during our, our last podcast with Tim Pip of Beast Tees, he mentioned the exact same thing. You yeah, would yeah. much he, he will buy the product and sell it at cost to a contractor just yeah. so they get that buying power with their supplier and everything else. And now I totally agree with you. Um yeah. and, and and so you have the contract world, which is again more of we're gonna print for less money. And they're often going to supply the product and so forth. It is different than drop ship fulfillment. Um, drop ship fulfillment is often, you know, in the deco world, if you have an affiliate site that you provide a client, maybe they're going to sell retail merch that you're shipping directly to the end consumer. Or maybe it's an ordering portal that you're shipping a product to an employee just to make the ordering process easier. But you're, you're taking out a lot of the busy work on your, your customer's hands. Um, I do know that you um, often work with a lot of influencers. I mean, if you look at what how social media has changed the world the past 15 years, I mean, how do these 18-year-olds make millions of dollars just look? I, I just share photos of myself and, and so forth. Well, a lot of them probably sell some things like branded apparel or merch and so forth. So Millions how, of dollars of it. Yeah. How, how does the drop ship? How how did you get kind of into that, and and what how, what part of your percentage of your business is it something you seek out, or is it again kind of like that contract where 
it's that cherry on top to, di to get you that little bit of diversity. Um, again, reduce your risk, bring in some extra revenue. Um, yeah, what is the philosophy behind the dropship of fulfillment in your eyes? Um, well, so that's how I started the company, right? Like initially like getting into like real business, not like 10 grand a year, but like <laughs> piece of money. Um, so what we did was we emailed 5,000 people with an email list um, that we generated technology for, or we developed technology for uh, to scrape YouTube. And at the time it was way easier than it is today. Um, but we scraped all that data of a million subscribers or more and we emailed them all and we hit on a bunch of them. Um, so that's how we got the customers initially. And this was in 2016. So we're now five years later, still working with some of the same ones. Um, and it's been, it's a great business because you can watch them grow. And as they grow, you grow. Um, and so like for, let me give you an example. Like one of our customers um, is an influencer. We build the store. It's contracted. We built, not contracted, but we build a contract. They sign a, a supply agreement. Um, they're locked into it and we take a rev split. So whatever they sell, okay. it, it might be a 90, 10, but that's after cost, right? Yep. So we've, we've already quoted out what our guesstimate is, is what they're going to sell. And yep. then we, we split it. So what a customer we started with in 2016, he sold merch. Um, he had, I don't know, 500,000 subs, maybe, maybe less than that. I don't know how we got him. I think it was just a referral. And um, he maybe sold like $5,000, right? La 2019, December, we did a release for, for him as well. And he had grown. He's at like over a million subs now. And he sold $600,000 in a month. So, I mean, it just depends, <laughs> like, like you, you pick up one client, like and it could change your life. So that's the beauty of it. It's just really hard to tap into um, because with, with the way, like YouTube changed, like people didn't yeah. have managers in 2016. Like it wasn't really a thing. Like they managed the business, business for themselves. So now that agencies and managers have really picked up these guys, they, they have their own relationships. And so now it's a screen printer to management company relationship. Um, unless you were in early, but, but yeah, I mean, these guys grow and they sell a shitload of merch. And I mean, if you can pick up an influencer that has a million plus, don't be surprised though. I've had, I've had people with 8 million subscribers to sell $10,000 of merch. Like it just depends. And so yeah. it's really tough. Um, it's really tough to judge how somebody's going to do it. Most of the, the, the main priority of the client that you're working with in that influencer, their job is just to get people to come to the site, right? That's the only wow. thing you're really asking them to do. Um, yep. it's funny how you said, you know, back in the day in 2016 and so forth, um, <laughs> I remember yeah. back, um, Facebook, it was exact same thing. It used to be, you know, back in like 2014 ish. Um, cause I had these types of clients where, Hey, you've got a million fans on your Facebook page. All million are going to see that post. And it yep. was incredible incredible what you could do overnight with just, hey, we're going to put up this design and before you know, we're going to have, we're going to sell 300 over the next uh, few hours. Yep. Totally, Facebook changed all that. It, it Before you knew it, hey, it didn't matter how many fans you had on your Facebook page. It, it wasn't going to uh, be the same. So um, it, I, I do agree with you. What, what you kind of said though, there was, was perfect though. Um, you know, you, how that one client can change your business, but at the same time, that one client could always leave, or two, YouTube we, could change yeah. their concept of how something happens and so forth. So that's why we don't rely walk, on it. I told you it was a cherry on yeah. top, you know, because it is sketchy. You 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 walk kind of that thin line though of pursue what is available at the moment where the money is, knowing mm -hmm. that this is probably going to potentially go away. But I mean, strike where the iron's hot, um, because yeah. that's six hundred grand. I mean. Hey, everybody would like to do 600 grand with one client relationship kind of to manage um, yeah, at that time. I mean, it's nuts. I mean, yeah, these guys have a lot of power and um, definitely worth working with if you have the opportunity. So with, with these first bundle, not the supplier, which you obviously kind of became a supplier as well. What I like about these different models here is technically you can typically use the exact same equipment you don't have to buy more. Now, if you're doing contract, obviously you should have some automatic equipment and be able to put out yeah. more. But if I do contract, there's nothing stopping me from the dropship fulfillment. 
it, when it comes to what the equipment, I could buy more equipment, but again, it's the same skill. It, it, it's not like um, you have to go. You're in a unique situation, Hunter, where it, it sounds like you're literally at capacity and you almost have to turn people away until you can get a building because out of the 50 <laughs> yeah, right. states, you were a night shift. <laughs> I mean, your, your state is smaller than what? Uh, 50 cities throughout the U.S. practically. Um, yeah. So you, you're, yeah, you're definitely um, a little uh, a different, but why should you pursue Sorry. multiple revenue? Sorry, go ahead. That's why your brand, I was just saying, that's why your brand is so important. Like, don't underestimate your brand. Well, and, and you know, like you mentioned the brand, Ryanette, what a great brand. And he had Ryanette.com. But you know what, yep. he? I, I would love to know what he spent on this, but he bought, you know, like screenprinting.com. What could have been a better, you, you know, domain name to buy? Um, I know it's spent, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. I'm sure it was a lot. Um, but it was ingenious. It is, in, and he, I mean, no one knew how to teach screen printing better. No one has. Um, he showed me, he showed me, well, a little, little, little tip. He showed me his GoDaddy, dude. He has like 2,500 domains. <laughs> so he doesn't I'm gonna, play around. I'm going to tell my wife slash secretary that because she's complaining about how many domain names I own. And I'm like, it's like retail 100. marketplace. I mean, it's, it's real estate practically. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's literally real estate. Um, I, I think it's important too. Um, but yeah, I couldn't believe it. He had like 25. He's like, dude, my company's like kind of getting pissed because like I spend a lot <laughs> every year renewing these things. <laughs> He's like, yeah. I think I'm going to unload some. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I spend at least $300 a year just renewing domains. Oh year. yeah, 100%. Um, and, yeah. and, and I try again, don't, it, it, it's a weird thought for a lot of people. Why would you do that? It's an investment. Guess what? Yeah. I mean, those dot coms aren't going anywhere. I mean, you, an angel that, investor, an angel investor that I was going to work with on a tech project a while ago sold LeBron.com for four and a half million. So if oh. that gives you any insight, that's uh, that's the direction it could go. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Um, so why do we why do we pursue different revenue streams? One, let's make more money. Two, diversify yeah. your revenue. You don't want all your eggs in one basket. You want to reduce your risk. Keep your staff busy throughout the year. You you pretty much said it. You you did things last year, not even mu as much for yourself, but the the company isn't Hunter. The company yeah, yeah. is the team, and you didn't want to break apart the team. And you're going to do whatever it takes to keep the team in place. I mean, these uh, people have to feed feed themselves. They have to feed their families. They gotta like people have lives, man, and it sucks. But yeah, hundred percent. Keep your staff busy. <laughs> put your yeah. You put yourself in your your um, employee's shoes. Yeah. By the way, Hunter, what were you studying in college? Um, graphic design, because I already knew how to do it. I didn't want to go. Um, but yeah, so I that's all. My okay. my parents, my, my dad was a, a cop, my mom's a teacher. No, I didn't have any like and no one was in business that I knew. I don't know how I came <laughs> of this, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, the, the civil servants as parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, For real. So who should prefer who should pursue different revenue streams and diversification? Well, any shop who wants to grow their business while taking really not much risk because you shouldn't have to be buying a bunch of extra equipment. Um, it comes a lot of it down, like you mentioned, your capacity. If you don't have the time on the equipment, or you don't have the space, um, because I bet when you're doing the dropship fulfillment and the contract, I mean contract, heck, you could have 50 boxes come in from, from somebody. You gotta have the space to store it um, or you can't do something else there. So yep. um, a, a lot of it comes down to, you know, what what you currently do, you don't have to make a bunch of investment, hire a bunch of people right off the bat to diversify your business. Now, do you often have no. to? Yes, but is it completely necessary? I don't think so. Um, how do you manage several revenue streams at once? Because obviously, a lot of different things are going on. You've got to be, you got to stay focused. You mentioned it. You got to be using some type of software. If everything's on pen and paper, whiteboard, it, it, there's no way you're going to be able to keep yourself um, organized. Deco Network software. If you're on, um, Deco Network has three primary uh, plans: the standard, the premium, and the enterprise. The standard plan. So one here, let me. Yeah, I want to throw this out there too. Um, so. 
for us, like I knew what I was doing when I started this company. I had this whole plan in my head. I never wrote it down. I don't believe in business plans. <laughs> um, but um, Decker Network was the first thing that we invested in. Um, it was actually the one of the partners, the, the way he became a partner uh, was by investing the money to have Decker Network for a year. Um, and, you know, he was going to be a partner either way, but that was one of the ways we justified it. Um, so even if you get it before, you start your business, if you're not starting, that is the most important thing, at least it was to us. Um, and so like having some kind of software, and I'm not saying it has to be Deco, but something is, is absolutely better than nothing. We started yes. with monday.com. Uh, we invoiced yeah. two invoices through QuickBooks before we got Deco. That's how important it is. Well, and, and just like, okay, you, you know, look at it that way. You just mentioned QuickBooks. QuickBooks is bookkeeping software. Can you create Correct. quotes and invoices through QuickBooks? Absolutely. Is it what QuickBooks was really designed to do? No. no. Uh, you're not going to be able to account for every variable, for example, that Deco Network can, but can Deco Network no. truly report your taxes and your account and everything that, that, that we need to do? No, that's why QuickBooks no. exists. So, yeah. um, software obviously it, it, it's going to make it soft if it, the software should always do one of two things if not both one it's got to make you more efficient it's got to save you money by saving you time and yeah. two with deco network if you're on the premium or the enterprise plan you have up to 500 websites or an unlimited amount of websites now i'm not saying more websites makes more money but it it's streams of revenue it's channels sales channels to bring in sales um and again you could drop ship fulfill for um influencers businesses it could be an ordering portal for some of your clients um just know that being working smart you know in deco network uh like your contract orders hunter i i don't know if you do this but you could absolutely create an ordering portal for all your contract clients and those oh, come yeah. in as a quote request or as an order directly into business hub all you have to do is download the artwork get ready to receive the the order and you're good to go stop taking that email re-enter it into deco um you know they always say work hard then smart don't think you're going to work hard and then you're going to be lazy work uh, i'm sorry work smart then hard let's see i'm stupid there yeah. Work smart, then hard. Um, and, and software should drastically um, be making you more efficient. The biggest mistake I see with software though, is if you, you gotta realize like Deco Network, it's powerful. I mean, it's very powerful stuff. Hunter, you have, you're young too, I just say that. But you're yeah, young, you grew up with technology, you can absorb it a lot quicker than a lot of people. Um, a lot and of- it's, And it's not you, perfect, I mean. Yeah let's let's get to the reality like it's not perfect like there is workarounds and like if you're if you're focused on posting on the on the, the forums about your 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 problems that are maybe just you not i mean i made the same mistake like put some time into setting it up you know and, and like and don't treat deco network like custom ink it's just not what it is um it, you know it has the, the the added value of the designer but it's not custom ink and customing has probably spent over a million bucks on technology at this point. Yep. So, I mean, understand what you're working with, because when you, if you don't understand what you're working with, you're, you, you shouldn't even have it. Like take time. This thing, this stuff takes time to understand. I'm still learning something new about Deco damn near every month. So like take the time and set it up. And if you don't want to set it up, pay somebody to set it up. But like at the end of the day, Deco can do and support your business. I promise. Yep. Yep. It, and, and, and yeah, they, a lot of people sign up, I think for any software like custom ink or um, ink soft, Deco network shop works. And they think that that software is what's going to make them a billion dollar business overnight. Not the fact that they actually have the team in place, the skill, I mean, everything The the software is going to help you stay organized, but that's not the, key to the castle in a way you know that's not going to be yeah, yeah. what you are the one who, who pushes it so um 
so a, a couple of things I, I often, um, I like to, I have a holding company that is Columbus promos. And then I have several different brands that are underneath that one umbrella. Similar to you, um, do you create, like if you, like the MassUSA.com, is that technically a subsidiary? Of it was, no, it was, it was meant to be an LLC. We just didn't have the time and the state was shut down and all this stuff. So we had to actually end up funneling the revenue through my own print house. But actually all of our other companies, I, I'd recommend setting up an LLC if you have faith in the company being bigger than anything else. But you're going to pay for it in accounting. So just know that you probably should be doing like, I don't know, a quarter million at least per company if you're going to build separate LLCs. Completely but, agree. I mean, yeah, it's completely. yeah, yes, yes, and you make great points there, Hunter. You, if if you keep it under one umbrella, you're going to reduce some of those costs. Like how much you pay in the accountants to get your taxes done and stuff. But there's definitely yeah. way uh, when you have that separate LLC. Um, build a strong team. It's quality over quantity. Uh, something we were talking about right before we started the podcast you don't like employee turnover. Obviously you do everything you can to keep your employees on. Um, it, again, the, 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 it's a team that you want to grow the business with. If you always probably heard this growing up, um, if you don't love what you do, then find something else to do. Um, you want to go, when you do show up at the shop hunter, hopefully you don't have to go all the time, but when you do, you wanna go there as happy as if you were spending time with your daughter. I know it's kind of hard to believe, but it's it's it, the well, idea. You, you, is, you, <laughs> everyone, here's how I look at it. I wanna I wanna come in in the same mood that I or I wanna leave with the same mood I came in with, right? Yep. <laughs> like at least or better. Um, and sometimes that's just that doesn't happen, and that's the reality of being a manufacturer. But um, yeah, that should be the goal. <laughs> that's yep. really goal. Um. All right. And okay, before we call it a uh, podcast, Hunter, I want to talk to you just a little bit about marketing because marketing, um, we have all these different ways we've talked about making money. It's not the same, you know, to, to market, for example, your um, to your influencers or that you offer dropship fulfillment. You market to those potential clients differently than to the local businesses who could become a print client um so if we market to them yeah yeah so i let's talk about social media for a second because i honestly think you're one of the best um that i've seen as far as putting out interesting content that is actually interesting to somebody who kind of follows your website so you posted this 22 hours ago and you got 10 likes that's pretty good i mean some people like oh look he just got 10 likes you got 10 likes posting a photo of shirts he printed that's good well and the hard part is like like facebook shows like what five percent yeah so, exactly um, it didn't before but, but yeah yeah they changed it um but but yeah i mean like you gotta post things that people want to see i mean we have somebody on staff that does it um and i think it's a wise investment um but you can do it yourself i did it myself for a long time um probably until until this year um and the the key to social media the key to marketing this way organically is consistency um and monitoring it so when i say monitoring it i'm talking once a quarter or if i notice that stuff is real down like if we're if we're losing like points every single day like we're down one point uh so just paying attention to your insights and, and seeing like if Oh, this week was better. What did we post this week? And just paying attention to the content. It's all about what your your fans or your followers want to see. Quality over quantity, right? Yeah, but consistency mostly. Consistent, yes, yes, consistency. Um, social media outside of Facebook, Instagram. What what other? LinkedIn, LinkedIn, Instagram, LinkedIn TikTok, Google, my business. Um, Twitter, we try to push to everything. We don't push to Twitter actually anymore, um, but yeah. And um, let's talk a little bit, so, so like SEO. Um, SEO is hopefully everyone knows, search engine optimization. And really what it means is get Google to like you when someone puts in a relevant search result into Google and you pop up. 
So if I put in I'm Maryland, gonna somebody, I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to give you guys a quick nugget though. Uh, the most valuable one right now in social media is Instagram Reels. Just wanted to put it there. Just Instagram you, Reels. You take that and run with it. If you take that and run with it, I'm telling you, it pays dividends. But go ahead. No, no. You know, I, I, I have a marketing degree from Ohio State, and I refuse. So I, I, I can't wrap my head around a lot of this social media marketing. How do images from Instagram? Lead you to so many sales. It, it's it's amazing right. how, how it works. It's, it's, so so reels is like TikTok, and the way that Instagram's trying to push reels right now is by pushing your reels like crazy. Um, so they're like TikTok at the beginning, everybody got views, tons of views, because they pushed it to everybody. But Instagram's doing the same thing with reels. We're getting like twenty five hundred views. We don't even have any, don't even have that many followers, but they're just trying to get people to like reels. They want people to use them, so they're they're enticing you to use them by giving you a ton of views. So definitely recommend checking it out. And then, and then, you know what, Hunter? In six months to a year, they'll stop doing that, and it won't work. And you know that—that's that's what okay. we're talking about. You—you you strike. I made out like a bandit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like I, anybody that listens. <laughs> it, they'll change it eventually, but. I uh, guess I went on. I was telling you about. He has 100k on TikTok from doing that at the beginning, and told me to do it. So yeah, anyhow. Um. Well, and I think you actually bring up another. Even people, you know, when I was at Ohio State, I joined a entrepreneurship club. That's the best thing I got on my degree. You know, my $60,000, yeah. the best thing I did was join an entrepreneurship club for $20 a quarter <laughs> at Ohio State because I networked with a lot of brilliant, passionate individuals who would, you know, a lot of them, hey, I'm starting an SEO company. I'm starting a, a, a marketing company. And and it is amazing, you know. You were mentioning you, you've got a friend who's 27 years old, and he what? How much did he do last year in revenue? He's 20. He's doing like 20 million a year. Yeah, that'd be totally different business. Totally different business, but like but, he, everything he touches turns to gold, like TikTok. And it's just, <laughs> but his experiences not, that he shares with you, even though you have nothing to do with roofing, that's what his business is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. But what he's learned, he shares with you, and you can apply it to your industry. Knowledge is power. Yeah. Um, and and you know what? Connections are key. Get, guess what you're not going to learn about in college? That Instagram that? thing you just mentioned. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, what you yeah, don't yeah, yeah. learn in the classroom. Actually, my best classes in college when I took marketing, um, it was taught by a psychologist, which is great. I mean, a lot of marketing is appealing to the psyche. So it, this guy was a psychologist, didn't have a business degree. I took like three yeah, classes with him. Every one of his classes was just... Year. It was discussion based by making it completely discussion based. That was the only time I learned, um, you know, where is the world going with, with a lot of this. But if I put in Maryland screen printing, which is very relevant to what you do, you're coming up on the first page of Google. If that, you're not on the first page. Go ahead. That top guy, first off, we're the second listing. Facebook just beat us up there. Um, but the Maryland screen printers has been around for 40 years, they do like 25 million a year, 30 million a year. Like for us to be there is pretty, pretty awesome. I mean, it, it really is. And, it, and it's, and it's Deco's SEO. I mean, we were there before, but like Deco's SEO plays a big, big part. Yeah. You know? And well, so, and let's talk about the SEO. Uh, I, I mean, there's on page SEO, there's off page SEO. There, there's a lot about SEO. And you know what? A lot of my clients who I help with their websites or teach them the software, they ask me, do you offer SEO services? And I'm like, no, for a couple of reasons. One, I can't have, I can't do SEO for companies that are going after the same market. It, it never yeah. would work. Secondly, you need someone typically who knows what they're doing to get you the ROI. I, if I don't know how to do something, I, I call myself a Deco expert because I'm an expert at using Deco network software. I'm not an SEO expert. I'm not about to take someone's money and tell them, yeah, I bet we can drive more traffic. Um, that's why I, I think, you know, you, you either take the time to really do it yourself, right? Or you take the time to hire a company or somebody who does it to, to, to get you where you are. Um, and I mean, it takes, it takes one Google search. You know, I did it myself. Yes, I know. I'm not, I'm not brilliant or anything. So just do it yourself. It's better than nothing, right? I Oh, I, you know, how to write a meta page title and description. You know, right. you yeah. Google that. You can read an article. And before you know it, you can optimize your pages. If you look here as I'm on your site, 
Each one of your pages has a unique description. Oh my gosh. Hey, check it out, Hunter. The thing that you said you didn't print it is the first thing on products, Guild of 5000. So, <laughs> yeah, that, I, I think that's, that's deco generated SEO. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like, the, the reality is if you want to set yourself up for success, you've got to teach yourself how to do things, things you've never done. I mean, if, you, if I told you how much we spent on Facebook advertising for masks, you would throw up. Like, and I never touched Facebook advertising before. Um, so, you know, you've got you've to gotta teach yourself how to do stuff. And if you don't do that, you know, you're yeah. just going to be complacent. And, and, and another thing that I think is driving a lot of your SEO, you mentioned Google My Business. Um, Google My Business, from what I remember how it all came down, uh, like six years ago, Google's like, hey, we're going to compete with Twitter and Facebook by creating this Google Plus concept yep, I remember nobody Plus, wanted yeah. to use it and essentially they kind of turned it into here's google my business it is a profile for a business your customers can leave reviews which is huge and it you know when you the reason why hunter you said you're on the first page of google for maryland screen printing is because you are um for for a couple different reasons one you are on the first page but two you when you're competing you're really often competing right here, local SEO. You're trying yeah. to um, attack your market, as in most of these are going to be within a 20-mile radius of, of where and I we am. Run, we run ads on that because it's hard to actually, like, SEO that. Like, it is. It's location-based. It's browser-based. Like, it's, it's hard to, yep. to touch that. It, 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 but you know what? Before that, Custom Inc. would have always beaten all of us. So it, it yeah, yeah, for sure. made it a lot more fair for um, when Google started doing this. This was the, all the social media uh, profiles, you know, they, they let you make a ton of money and then they take it out from the rug. Google, actually, this local SEO changed a lot. Um, yeah, and for sure. this is where you, you want to kind I mean, of look start. At, look, at, look at custom X, like targeting at Maryland screen printers. <laughs> like that's, I know Craig who ends that. It's, a, it's just nuts. They, they, you're never going to catch them. You're never, you know, you want, custom ink is searched more than custom t shirts. Well, and those CPC, they just will outbid the shit out of anybody trying to run ads. Yep. It sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of different ways you can drive traffic to your site or, um, again, to, to market your services because, you know, when, when you're, um, you're influenced, how much of your business, though, is word of mouth? Because that's the best form of marketing. I want to give one of my clients a great product. They work with, they talk to another business. I'm like, man, that is a nice jacket you're wearing with the embroidery and all that. Where'd you get it? Got it from Maryland Print House. You're, if you put out a great um, product, your customers will gladly share your information. I'd say like 60%, 60%, 70 60%. And that's why you hadn't hired a sales rep really until this year. Is that correct? Yeah. We, we're trying to hit a goal that's pretty, pretty large and, I think we're going to need sales team to do it. But yeah, I mean, we've gotten this far without one. It's pretty nuts, um, you know, but certain okay. numbers. <laughs> one last require. question for you, yeah, Hunter. Um, I look at the industry, uh, typically, would you agree that you don't really sell products? You offer services? We sell an experience. Sense? I think that's the way that we word it. Um, like, yeah, we sell an experience. So you could come in knowing nothing about t-shirts and you could come out knowing a lot about t-shirts and printing and everything. We give most customers a tour. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really selling experience because people don't know how t-shirts are made. They really think that like they're printed on an inkjet printer. Um, <laughs> and that's sometimes sometimes the case, but not always. Yeah. Um, and especially at scale. So it's I think it's really interesting to, to give them that experience because then we bring them into the conference room, we talk about them, it's a much clearer on why we're charging what we're charging and we don't even have to say it. Yeah, and and um, no, I, it make, makes total sense to me. Um, you obviously have a vision that it has changed over the years a bit, but um, sure. it, it, at the end of the day, it, it comes down to hard work, a great team, and and just that, that passion to, um, to, to stick with it. I mean, I'm sure, would you agree? Last year was one of, it had to be the hardest year ever. I mean, hey, I know what oh, it was yeah. like to uh, first have a newborn and I know what it can be like leading up to that 
uh, birth. Yeah. It is a crazy time. Um, and to have a pandemic um, like what you had, but you know, we, the, the, the listeners on this are, are pretty much all um, other shop owners. Um, as an entrepreneur, you know, you, you, there are so many pros and cons, um, but I, I think what, what you have to always realize is um, you control your own destiny. You know, yeah. you have you so much- vacation, You're gonna have the consequences of that. Like yeah. you, you've got to realize and, and always be self-aware on what you're doing and how it's affecting your people and your, your company. And, and yeah, and, and it sounds like you often put yourself in the shoes of your employees. Um, 100%. And, 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 and think, you know, if I was, if I was in their position, you know, how would this go? So Hunter, I want to thank you for um, your input today. It, it was definitely great. Um, I, it's amazing what all you've done at such a young age. Um, you, you know, you, Thanks, you, you, you got a lot of a bright future ahead of you. Um, you are like a mini Ryan. Mo you, you look a little bit like Ryan. <laughs> you know, right. But yeah, gosh, uh, what, um, yeah, what, what a, what a crazy last year. And again, how the industry just, you never know where it's going to go. Um, and I, I guarantee you in five years, you'll have some different revenue streams that you're not using now. Um, oh, and I'm excited yeah. to show you guys about it. So, nope. um, but yeah, well, thanks, Zach. I really appreciate everything you do and Deco Network as well. I think you guys are great. And I look forward to building our relationship. Thanks, Hunter. Um, if you can stick around for a second for maybe some questions. Yeah. Otherwise, I know you're real busy. No, no, um, no, no, no. Actually. So, Victor, um, do you want to open it up to some questions or how do I do this? Have we had questions submitted yet? Do we have any questions? I click hey, questions. I don't see any, but I don't know. Hey, Zach. Uh, it's Victor here. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm in the background. I'm the tech guy. Uh, uh, Zach, no questions yet, um, but anyone who's um, on the webinar, we do have a questions box. Uh, feel free to jump in there, drop your questions for Zach and Hunter, and they'll be able to answer and, and have discussions based around those topics. So. We'll just give it a minute and we'll get some of your questions in. Hunter, did you say you built, you made this uh, banner yourself? Yeah. Well, I'm, I didn't I'm, do the isometrics. I, I subbed it out, but yeah, I did. I put it all together. I did the 3D and stuff. You're a little, little Ryan Mac <laughs> press and everything. <laughs> yeah, we have, our, we have a 1012 Rock Max um, that's in storage. Sucks. Um, but yeah, I, I can actually, I'll give you a, if you want, I can send over the the new one. Give people a sneak peek while we wait. Hunter, what, sweet. what what all types of ink do you screen print with? Um, well, we're kind of limited because we don't have gas, so we can't like do water-based to its full potential. Um, but we can print water-based, um, plastisol. Uh, we're tr actually r and at this time silicone um we don't touch dis discharge it's just too small of an area but i'm sure we'll have no issue printing it um dtg well, yeah we talked about that uh yeah my but, experience but screen printing in particular that silicone um i definitely had to i bought several different um uh samples from different that's a work i'll tell you what some of that silicone hey we're going to use this catalyst and we're going to do this and it's going to dry in the screen after you know half a minute it's, it's a yeah, hard you process you, yeah, yeah but good. unfortunately all the, all the big players use it yeah it it well i'm wearing adidas something right now yeah. and i can feel it and you're like yeah that that ink is either vinyl or it is silicone it's definitely silicone. It's definitely it's silicone. Really they didn't cut a bunch of vinyl. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it is. And it's pretty amazing. Like, it's pretty new. Um, it's pretty no, it's, new uh, process. Um, no, I, I, I definitely, it, it's, you know, screen printing is an art. It's, it's it, it, you know. You don't That's why I wish you had certifications like they have for like plumbers and stuff, but like, no. We don't and it really sucks because that's what we need um you well, know 
you mentioned like, you know, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I think a lot of degrees are just one, they, the, if you don't, I mean, I, as I studied marketing, I could tell you Ohio State was a business more than anything. That's all they cared about was making yeah. money from yeah. their Basically student, money, right? not educating us. They care less how much I learned. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, you know, two things that I think are often overlooked and put down. One, trade schools. Uh, I don't understand why more kids don't attend trade schools in high school. And they used to teach screen printing and a lot of these trades. Yeah. At, uh, and they kind of have stopped a little bit. And secondly, yeah, I, there's none by me, for sure. There's like none. And, and second would be um, like, oh, what are we going to say? Um, uh, uh, community colleges, How, you know, at Ohio State, I took calculus and I was paying over, I was paying like $1,200 for a class. And I had, we had 300 students in the classroom. There's over, there's like almost half a million dollars in tuition in the classroom. And they give us a graduate student who doesn't speak English. And it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, no, they don't. I mean, it's like, what the heck am I paying for? So during the summer, I went to the community college because the community college offers way more classes during the summer. They transfer right over. I had a perfectly speaking individual, 12 people in the classroom for a third of yeah. the price. I mean, Dude, you I mean I, tell me that that education wasn't better than the, than the high school. I mean, I mean I'm crazy. not a dumb person, like, at all, I don't think. Um, and I finished high school with a 2.8. To like 2.9 and i would have finished college with work like maybe maybe worse than that if i actually didn't like drop classes before i failed them <laughs> i just <laughs> didn't want to be there i i just never wanted to be there you know and i've always believed that like if you're passionate about something you need to chase it but you know it's a hard my dad was a d1 uh soccer player so it's wait uh, yeah so where'd you go hard. where you, you were a d1 soccer player hunter no my no my dad was i was a d3 soccer player um i probably if i put my mind to it could have done that um, but I, it's not what I wanted. Um, but I played at Frostburg state. I went to school for graphic design, um, because I had already known how to do graphic design. I already knew how to use illustrator, Photoshop, all that stuff way prior to, to college. Um, and you know, I just went cause it was easy and I was just trying to get a degree to please my parents. <laughs> and then I finally made the decision that like, you know what, I don't really need this and I'm, I'm paying for it. I pay for my own school, so I'm going to drop out. And that's what I did, you know, and it's the best thing I ever did. I mean, it's pretty nuts, but yeah, yeah we got any questions? No, nope. we, we are, we are good, Hunter. I, th I think we just answered them all. We just talked so well. Um, thanks <laughs> again so much, Hunter, for your time. Um, good luck growing the business. I, I'm very confident yeah, that you will. And um, hopefully maybe we do this again in like a year and see where you're at. Yeah, dude, that'd be sick. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And until um, next time. Thanks, Hunter. You have a good one. Bye, guys. See you.